Pixel Civ is proudly supported by you. We couldn't do what we do each week without your help. And if you'd like to show your support for Pixel Civ, you can do so right now by heading to our merch store at pixelsiv.com.au forward slash store and pick up some t-shirts, tote bags, or even some severely yellow Pixel Civ socks. Johnny designed them, so he's really proud of them. So you really need to buy them. Otherwise, his feelings are going to be hurt. Um, head to pixelsiv.com.au forward slash store and enter the promo code SIFTERS to get 25% off your order. That's pixelsiv.com.au forward slash store and the promo code SIFTERS. Hello and welcome to episode 95 of Pixel Sieved. If this is the first time you're joining us, we're a weekly gaming show where we talk about indie games, and talk to indie game creators from around the world and ask them why they create the things that they do. My name is Mitch and joining me is my co-host Sarah. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm sorry about that. I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> anyway, our guest this week is the creator of This American Dream, Nicholas McDonald from Samurai Punk. Nick, thanks for joining us. Yo, good day, everyone. How you doing? Uh, yeah, so when we last spoke to Nick back in 2016 on episode 19, we've been and we've been following the progress of this American dream closely over the past two years. Um, we're really excited to have you back on the show to talk about it. But first, Sarah, what are we looking at today? Today, we're going to be discussing video games and time, the issue of whether video games are too long or not, and is it fair to criticize a video game based on how quickly you can play through it? Yeah, so all that and more coming right up. You're listening to Pixel Sift, or you might be watching Pixel Sift on Twitch. Pixel Sift. So, the length of video games. So, some people have been saying recently that games have become a bit too long. I'm not really sure that I agree with that. It's just, it seems like if you don't enjoy a video game enough that you find it too long, I think maybe you just might not like the game. What do you guys think of that? I think part of the problem with that is that nowadays people have less and less time. I guess for the people that are writing reviews and saying this game's too long, they're usually probably people that are studying or have full-time work or maybe have families or, um, you know, other, you know, social things that they need to do. And it's like the, the amount of time that we can spend across games is becoming more and more thin because as more and more games come out, it's like, how do you kind of spread out your time? So I think more and more people are kind of getting upset that, you know, like let's take Skyrim, for example. I mean, it keeps getting re-released anyway, so it's not, it's kind and you, you know, you've got all these different quest lines. How do you kind of get the most out of all of that when the game is just too big, realistically, unless it's the only game you're playing, I guess. And like, I, when people need to like divide their attention between so many different titles, I guess it, it is pretty easy to feel overwhelmed. But to say a game is too long, it seems like not long ago we were criticizing um, like Order, Order 1886 while not being a very great game as a whole, was we were criticizing it for being too short. And that kind of thing, uh, has that has that gone away, do you think? I'm not sure. I mean, seeking, looking at the order, I was doing some research onto that today and I thought it was very interesting, like what I dug up. Um, the big criticism around the order seemed to have come from one particular YouTube video where a guy played through the game in about five hours' time. Now, the big thing to keep in mind here is that apparently, um, I didn't find the video, but I read a couple of articles on it. The, the articles described that he didn't do any exploring. He just kind of went straight for the waypoints, didn't kind of take his time, didn't really kind of look around like you usually do. You want to look at the scenery, you want to check out maybe just some side areas is you want to kind of just take your time and enjoy it he kind of just rushed through not like a speed runner but like somewhere in between like someone who was just dead focused on getting through the game as quickly as possible without you know using exploits or anything like that and a lot of people kind of took that and was like oh this game's too short when you know in reality like um the the devs of the game were looking at you know people that had were clocking in hours between 10 to 15 on average instead and it was kind of like well that's a bit more of an accurate representation of the length of the game and you know but people were kind of using that as a huge criticism against the game costing a triple a price though i'm not sure i mean i guess it really just depends on on the game in question uh nick i understand that you have some views uh toward this um care to share your thoughts yeah so i think i could definitely echo that um and i think it's because a lot of the especially the critics playing video games right now a lot of them grew up in the era of the classic japanese rpgs that are in the like tens to 80 hours of gameplay um and there's some amount of entitlement there that they've grown up with, but then they moved on to, you know, writing about games 
and becoming adults at the same time and having to put up with the fact that they don't have the time to play all of, oh my God, sorry, Justin's in chat. Um, <laughs> and they don't, have, they don't have the time to, uh, to play these games. So it's, it's like a constant back and forth between gamers who are young, right, and want to get the most value for money uh, from their titles, and then the people who are increasingly aging with the games and as developers and press themselves age, uh, we're starting to see the sort of divergent needs of customers, um, despite the fact that games tend to be marketed broadly as opposed to like very focused, you know? Nick, speaking, like going on from um, the idea of, I guess, marketing and price and stuff, one of the big complaints that I saw or like one of the things discussed around the order in particular, because it was a game that sparked a lot of controversy around its, its short playtime, arguably. Um, one of the um, the CEO of the company that developed the game uh, made a statement saying, you know, like that he'd played two hour games that were far better than, you know, games that lasted him 16 hours. And he kind of used that and a couple of other statements as justification for, you know, we should be allowed to make short games. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But a point that one of the articles that I wrote from Forbes brought up was that the, the two hour games that he played surely were not sold for $60 US, you know, in comparison. What do you think of that as far as, you know, the cost of a game reflecting upon its length and the amount of experience that you get out of that um i think to an extent I, again this is as i also become older it's becoming more like finding time to play these things is becoming worse and worse and worse but <clears throat> to an extent i think that's totally true you know uh, i think if you're looking at a title that's 60 dollars, you want it to either have like so much replayability that it makes up the time or its quality like passes out the point where a two hour experience is as is worth 10 hours, you know, um, <clears throat> because the narrative and the level of polish matches the sort of padding, if you will, of other games. Um, and I think it's in becoming increasingly subjective, like I said before, to the point where it's kind of hard to distinguish, you know, the customer base and what they want, as opposed to, um, how do I put this? Yeah, it's, it's becoming hard, uh, you know, and, and especially in the space of the AAA games where their budgets get bigger, the title length doesn't tend to get much bigger. You know, they still sit around the 6 to 12 hour point, um, but their budgets keep getting bigger and bigger. So they need to keep reaching a broader and broader audience um, to match the budgets increasing. And it's becoming tougher and tougher for them to satisfy that audience. Um, yeah. Do you think that maybe, I guess, the um, the amount of hours that you can clock in, let's just say, single-player storyline games, do you feel like that's like a bit of a bragging point as a game developer within the industry? Do you feel like maybe games use the whole badge of, oh, yeah, we boast X many hours of gameplay? Do you feel like that's become more of like a status symbol as far as, oh, buy our game instead, we're going to give you 10 extra hours than their game? Uh, yeah, I think 100% it is. We, especially when you're dealing with something over about $20, uh, I think there's sort of, a leniency when things are under a certain price point that you kind of expect something more experimental. But when you get to the price of around twenty to sixty dollars, uh, develop like consumers, and this is less of an issue on Steam, but consumers start to expect a certain style of experience and a certain amount of content for every dollar uh, to go as far as some people who expect a certain amount of megabytes per dollar. Um, <laughs> but they're a little silly. Um, I'm not joking; they exist. Uh, so. <clears throat> yeah, and as a developer who's done this, uh, who has used the amount of hours in his game to justify a certain price point now, uh, because we we decided that, you know, this game is longer than we were expecting, so I think we could raise the price. Uh, it's, it's I can exact, I can see exactly where they're coming from. Uh, and as someone who needs to hit a $60 game, I think I, I can see the struggle for a developer who's, you know, got 200 to 1,000 people working on their title They've, you know, put $15 million into it, but it's, you know, only a six hour game. It might be the best six hours you've ever played, but when you look at the back of the box and it says six hours of quality gameplay, I think Vanquish is a really good example of this. Um, one of my favorite games that is like super, super tight and knows exactly what it's trying to do. Um, you just, it's, when you're just like at the store, it's hard to justify that purchase, especially when you're younger. Do you feel like maybe padding is part of the problem there? Oh, sorry, Mitch. <laughs> like, do, do games like tend to maybe you know? Do you feel like they're in the in the industry? You know, games are just kind of padding extra garbage gameplay in just to try and get that mark so they can justify a larger price point. Maybe. Um, you know, I can't speak for AAA 
entirely because yeah, it's but too many games. it may just it may just be super legacy you know uh, yeah like i said the the audience starts to get broader but i don't think our games are instead of our games starting to focus more on that audience you know games that target children not in a negative way but they target children and say you know they want value for money because they only have you know 60 dollars to spend for the next six months uh and games that charge at adults who are willing to have a more mature experience that's shorter and instead of padding it out with gameplay they can focus in they just kind of ran right in the middle uh, and we get kind of these awkward points where you have games like uncharted that are essentially trying to be interactive movies but they're about eight eight to ten hours long and they're just full of nathan drake shooting and murdering people which is at a point where it's almost antithetical to his character uh who's meant to be this like gallivanting indiana jones character so it's a uh, it's weird and i i think it is just due to the sort of ever-increasing scope of games in that space uh, you don't really see it when games have smaller budgets and smaller teams because they don't need to do these kinds of things is the amount of gameplay like the the hard number as in terms of hours is that something you consider when developing is or, or how quickly does that come up in the development process for you yeah so i, I guess we've got two good examples maybe three now uh of this so like screen sheet we were never thinking about it in terms of hours i guess because it's a a multiplayer game that we're trying to get people to play more, over and over again and ideally you don't think about it in terms of <clears throat> this game is an hour or two hours worth of content you think about it like how much variety am i providing to people in order to maximize the chance that someone will play this game for the longest amount of time and by long amount of time i mean anywhere from two to 50 hours even though objectively you could see all the content in maybe 40 minutes um and then with a game like american dream uh the, it's linear it's narrative based and we but that game is every minute kind of costs money in that game like that because the writing requires voiceover to be recorded and every scene in the game requires custom art to be made so it's a really different sort of conversation to have where in, you know screenshot i could say like okay i'm gonna add a new map it's gonna add a pretty clear amount of value to the title um you know it's you know 11 instead of 10 maps that's another chance that someone will play for an extra amount of time because they'll play this map for a little bit longer than they would other maps potentially. And then, you know, it'll take me a month and I can see the exact value you return on that. But in American Dream, you go into it, you say, okay, we want our story to kind of feel in the three to four hour range. Um, how much is that going to cost? More than like, do we want to hit the five hour mark? Do we want to hit the four hour mark? Um, I think for us, especially with the American Dream being a satire, we didn't want to overstay our welcome. Um, so it was actually important for us to keep it on the shorter end, not stretch it out too long. I think like it, it, it is just one of those things that you really need to consider when, like, when developing a game. It, 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 it's almost, it's almost, it almost seems, it almost seems tragic that you have to think about exactly how how long can I keep people's attention spans for. It, it's just so interesting to me. Yeah, I'm just going on our Steam page now. I wonder if we're even listing the hours the game takes. Uh, we, we list the amount of levels. We don't list how long the game is. Um, but, you know, in, in when I was sort of press, we often would remark that it was a, you know, a two-hour to a four-hour game. Uh, this is back when we didn't know exactly how long it was actually going to be. Um, and it, that's important because, especially in uh, sort of the experience category, which the American Dream kind of falls into, uh people are looking because they know that they're not gonna get a lot of replayability out of the title in terms of you know extra goals or all the secrets they can find uh, people are really looking for like value for money in terms of time yeah i've got a i've got a comment from uh sqdj on the uh twitch chat he says uh it saddens me that there are people out there that want more gigabytes for their dollars i that that who are who are these people i i, I don't want to meet these people Seriously, yeah, I've SD never, users. I've never heard of that before. Like that just, that just seems insane that anyone yeah. would kind of, we would measure a game based on gigabytes so when bizarre. you consider that some games' art style is so minimal and would take a lot less, and other games would just require more because their assets are larger of a completely different kind. Like, what are your I thoughts think this on came that? Up ar- that? This came up around No Man's Sky actually. Oh, no Man's Sky okay. landed at about three oh. and a half gigabytes, and they were like. How can this be an 80 hour game or whatever? It's only got three and a half gigabytes of mem of like 
data, it can't be that big a game because they obviously <laughs> didn't understand the way the game was constructed because they used to, you know, and it's, it's actually getting to the point because of the, all the high def textures in your modern games. I think I downloaded Halo 5 on my Xbox and that thing was 80 gig. Um, you know, the data sizes are getting so big that it's like directly aligning with pe what people understand as content. Fallout uh, 4 is I, I a good example as far as size. Yeah. A friend of mine downloaded it the other day and it was like, like I don't know, 80 gigabytes or something. It was huge. But then again, you know, that game's very different to the way that No Man's Sky is constructed. But I guess people that don't aren't involved in the development of games just have no idea of the construction that goes behind it. To me, yeah, almost... No, as... I don't... Yeah, you know, sorry. To me, almost a smaller game is better because of just the internet speeds I have to deal with. It's like I, if it's like, oh, it's smaller. Oh yeah, I'll play that right now. Yeah, awesome. I'll get that. <laughs> that, that, that yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, and I can only speculate that these people saying this are like younger. But my guess is that they really are trying to nickel and dime all the money their parents are giving them, or they they made at their weak job they have. So. Mm -hmm. That's my only my only theory on this, and maybe that if they're older, it's because they carried that over from that mentality. You know, they're still, you know, they're in their early twenties, but they they still need to maximize every dollar they spend on games because that's just how they started to think. And I even I had that mentality for a while. You know, I finished the new Kirby recently, and it was fairly short. I think it was a few hours long. Um, and but at the end of that experience, I'm like, mm, this was really short. But I'm pretty sure every level was almost identical. And that's the issue I took up with it. But that might be just because of the game designer side of what I do now. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Anyway, um, we will move on to our next topic. Uh, we are going to talk to you, Nick, about the American dream. Pixel Sift. <laughs> Pixel Sift. No, seriously, Pixel Sift. <laughs> no, seriously. Pixel Sift. Uh, so the American Dream is a game by Samurai Punk, and we have the creator of, the, of that game, Nicholas McDonald, here with us, uh, joining us to talk about it. Give us a quick rundown of the game, and uh, for those of the, us that don't know anything about it. I think uh, Justin and G in the chat sums it up really well. It's guns, guns, guns every day. So it's a, it's a virtual reality satire that takes place in the 1950s era World's Fair, where you have guns for hands and you use them for everyday life. Uh, we we take you through a series of different elements of life and you get to live out all your greatest gun fantasies. I noticed in the trailer that it starts off with a baby in the cot using guns to alert the mother that it wanted something. Is that like, is, does the game kind of go with you as you live like the full life of a person that grows up with guns from effectively day one? Or is that just like one of many different kind of elements? Do you play as multiple characters? No, so you, you caught it on the head. It's um the game is kind of structured like the world of tomorrow that uh, Walt Disney made ages ago, and I think it may have been the fifties or sixties. And we take you through sort of elements of normal fifties life as if you had guns, and we we take you through linearly in the order that you would do it. So you know you're a child, and then you're a teenager with your family. You go to school, you go to prom, you get a job, you get a you get some kids, and uh, that was actually the first thing we worked out about the game was that. We thought, well, we have all these little vignettes of life that we want to make fun of. How can we structure it in a way that will help us both tell a story? Because previously it was just going to be like a bunch of levels in a menu and you would pick them and play them uh, more like Job Simulator. But we, we were like, we want to structure this content to make it feel cohesive and part of like a narrative better world. So I, I, you chose to set it in like the 50s. Um, what was the, what was the uh, motivation behind that period of time? Uh, we we knew that we wanted to call the game the American Dream before that, and I was mulling over a lot of what the American Dream means to because this game is an outsider's opinion and an outsider's perspective, and a lot of <clears throat> the imagery that you think of uh, when you think of the American uh, classic fifties Americana, uh, the the family with two and a half kids, uh, you know, like we our artist even did. Uh, rendition for the, he did the sort of Rockwellian sort of key art for the game and we had to make sure that he didn't have a third kid that he had a dog instead <clears throat> but uh it was it just felt very natural and um this game is about creating this false sense of security and false life that you play and a lot of what the American dream is is false as well so it, it was 
very aligned with the game's intention. So you is have... the use of oh sorry, Mitch, is the use of like almost cardboard cutout figures throughout the game? Is that I mean I feel like like with the guns being kind of very nicely modeled, then you have these kind of cardboard cutout people that really it kind of has this very sinister vibe to it because none of these people are really real and you're kind of interacting with them in this harmless way. But the fact that it's guns kind of makes me feel really uncomfortable. It almost feels like it's a constant shooting range of real people. Was that a very intentional part of the development when you were trying to figure out how you wanted the game to look like? Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, I think it was because we we didn't we wanted to get this again that like photo like the painted photo Rockwelly look that the advertising of the time had across, and we also wanted it to feel a little uneasy. And there was something about watching the animatronic figures in the world of tomorrow like do their thing that I wanted to capture in the characters. So we started to just do all the people in the game like that. And it ended up being a huge, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but it was a massive cost saving into the game. Um, oh no, someone has a bug? Wait, no, they're talking about Phantom Pain. Um, I was like, I'm really worried they had a bug with my with our game. Um, yeah, it was a huge cost saving. Uh, so it, it did double duty, uh, but it, it also leads sort of into the narrative of the title. Uh, really directly so it's like just like setting in the 50s it kind of say it was one of those things you do that just kind of have a knock-on effect and lead to a lot of the decisions in the game unintentionally so you've had the opportunity to bring it the game over to america and show it to american audiences how do they react to this australian comment on their their culture uh yeah we've taken it to about four or five shows um over there and we've shown it in the west coast east coast uh, i never got a chance to show it in texas unfortunately um but they actually all love it um we've gone we, you know we've especially in the east coast we got a bunch of people who were uh they came up to us and said this game's thought-provoking and it you know it's obviously gonna <clears throat> they were they were using the word um oh god what were they saying it wasn't they were saying thought perfect they were saying it was um divisive <laughs> to my face and they were talking about how they were upset they couldn't bring their guns to boston and they were from vermont uh, and i always thought that was really interesting but we, we actually sat down and had a good chat during the show so i did apply for south by southwest justin but we did we couldn't go because it's right before gdc um yeah and uh yeah they, they really love it especially on the west coast they just kind of get it uh, i think and the reality is that a lot of america does get the game like very quickly and they they kind of like laugh and cry at the same time sometimes when they play it or see it. The game like walks a very fine line between political and and comedic. Like how did, how did you how did you find that balance? Um, it was pretty much a matter of just taking the piss and consistently like take, taking the piss consistently throughout the game despite the, the themes becoming heavier as the game went on. You know, uh, initially it was all just, isn't it funny, the character has guns for hands, they do everything with guns. Um, but as we wanted to start weaving a narrative into the title, it uh, became necessary to start having sort of more political themes come in, even though it was obviously intrinsically political. Uh, so what we had to do was balance out the seriousness of the situation consistently with more and more strange or just funny things like you know push the americana the game is narrated by a dog the whole time i think that may be one of the strongest things we changed really early um to have that because it helps just dial back everything a little bit and i don't think that lessens the impact of the, the game because the game is not about shocking you i don't think anything in this game is particularly shocking um you know if the if this game just depicts a form of reality and expects you to think about it it does not expect you to act on it so <clears throat> what um what that meant is that you could laugh with us instead of being laughed at that's a really great way to put that i like that um so ha have the recent gun related incidents in america affected the perception of it have you noticed anything uh, has it affected you on that kind of level um unfortunately i can't really talk about this much because it did affect us oh okay. uh, we launched um, we launched directly a month after the shooting in Florida, and then we launched the day of. We actually launched on everything the day of the walkout, um, and that had a big impact on our launch. And 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I can't really talk about it, but uh, it was definitely negative, but not from the public perception, uh, more from a platform perception. Is best I what see. I say. All right. Uh, that, that's all right. Um, I, I guess, so when, when Screen Cheat, your previous game, came out of, came out of a game jam, um, how did the development for um, the American Dream start? So it started in very early 2016. Uh, we were getting ready. I think we we had this game actually in our sort of tank for a while, but we didn't have any gameplay. We just had this idea. I think the original pitch document was called I Have No Mouth and I Must Shoot. Um, and it came from an internal joke where we were thinking, wouldn't it be funny if the guy from Call of Duty went home and tried to live his life? Because characters in FPS games notoriously don't talk or interact except shooting. So that was the impetus for it. And we had mulled that over for a long time to the point where it became a like, little shitty PowerPoint presentation I made saying, like, I'm going to make this little game about uh, this game about doing everything with guns. And I threw Sony the email and said, I want to make this. Um, let's make it happen. And it was <clears throat> during PAX South, funnily enough, I was ironically pitching it to a bunch of people I know at Sony and some publishers I was friends with, and we were just hanging out at dinner in, in San Antonio. And they were like, we basically designed the game at those events, which was really great. So we started to like say, okay, well, one, this could actually just be a thing. And then when we came home, we got the hardware from Sony to start prototyping it. Uh, and we, we had this kind of loose little prototype where you walked around a kitchen with a gun and you made coffee. Uh, we left it for about three months, actually, at that point. Um, we weren't super confident with the idea at the time because we were we were really worried it was just, you know, just a series of little gameplay motifs and not really, there was no sort of meat to it. So we left it for a while, worked on some other stuff, and then came back to it about three months before PAX West, where we announced the game and showed it for the first time. And we just were like, okay, well, here's all the things we want to do to make it work. And uh, we spent two to three months building the PAX West demo, uh, which eventually became kind of the scaffold for what the game is now. Excellent. When you guys were in that development stage, uh, when, when Sony gave you the, um, I guess, the equipment to start making it, was the intent from day one to make it a VR game? Or did that happen somewhere later down the line? Well, we already had the, the consoles. They... Um, I just wanted the hardware to play with. I didn't really, I was like, I had this dock and I wanted the headsets because I'm greedy, not because I wanted to make this game particularly. It was just like, as some friends of ours had gotten PSVR dev kits, so we wanted PSVR dev kits and I had a pitch. Um, and then we got it and played around with it. It was really fun. So, cause we were like, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Cause it'd be fun to, we were just finishing screen sheet at the time. We all needed a break. This was probably two months before the console ports came out. So we really needed something to do that was different, and this felt the most different. We just start doing that with like our podcasting equipment. We're just like, hey, we need stuff. <laughs> um, um, I think like I that that's awesome. Like you, you just took like a hardware opportunity and made a game out of it. That's awesome. Yeah, um, and it was definitely never originally that we were like, let's get on the VR train. That's going to be the shit, you know. So we. We, uh, we got the hardware and we found very quickly that if we wanted to make this game, it could only ever exist in VR because uh, a really powerful moment happened during development when uh, I think I had finished modeling one of the first block-ins of the gun. It was a pretty accurate Colt 1911. And we were just in this little kitchen room and I took the headset off. No, sorry, I had the headset on and I handed someone in the team the controllers. And instead of just putting it on the table, they pointed the gun at me. Uh, while I was still in VR, and I'm like, oh, that's a that was a really strong moment. I had a really shocked reaction because this gun, which had never I have never had a gun pointed at me in my life. I've never really been close to real guns, um, and I'm like, oh, this is really affecting and this shitty model of a gun. So I decided we were like, okay, this is a powerful medium to tell to sort of not even tell stories, uh, but to to do things that aren't possible in other mediums. I don't think if you you put a gun to someone's head in a flat screen game, as some people call them, uh, it would be as effective. And we use that sort of throughout the game. We, you know, you could do stuff with scale. You can make people eat off a gun, which happens in the first level, uh, to really bring them close to the thing they're not really normally that close to. 
Um, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Like VR seems like it's the only platform in which this game could really work. Like you could do it in, in a normal, I guess, flat screen game, but I feel like it's wonderful that it came like into existence at a time when VR is truly coming into like this beautiful thing that works so well. I think that's wonderful. I got a question here from Epiphorus. Um, were there any were there any scenes or levels that were cut from the game that you thought might not roll so well? Yeah, we cut about four or five levels from the game. I think total. Maybe we cut more. We cut little sections of levels as well, or some levels got you know merged together <clears throat> to sort of incorporate different elements. Uh, initially, the game was really. Um, we just kind of like would say like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if you cleaned the toilet with a gun? Wouldn't it be funny if you drove a car? And like every level was that initially until we we started to block out what the story would be to sort of tie all this together so uh we cut some stuff like the 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 whole driving section which is actually was publicly shown at pax west the first time that eventually just got cut because it was like it was a massive level the motion it still made some people motion sick and we were like it's not worth the amount of cost it will be to finish this thing plus the amount of people who will vomit to make a level just so you can drive a car with a gun. And we eventually did get a driving section working. It just wasn't that you were driving, the dog drives. Um, so that's better. Yeah, a, a lot of stuff had to get cut. Uh, there was a great scene where you you fixed a car up with the gun. It was like it was like sort of a the loosest mechanically. You just hit the car with the gun and it would get a health it would health bar would fix up. And then eventually spiders started falling from the, the roof. And you had to bash them off your head while, or shoot them as they were coming down, while you uh, you kept fixing the car, and it was like amazing. But well, we just were like, okay, well, one, this isn't a whole level on its own. It's just one really good joke. Also, it's from a total. It's just another game. You know, it's for the Australian dream. <laughs> yeah, it's a sequel. All right. So unfortunately, I've let time get a bit away from us there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Nick. It's been, no worries. Thanks it's for having been good me. having you on, and uh, thank you very much for joining me, Sarah. And uh, so, um, and also to the viewers, uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of Pixel Civ. Um, this this episode in particular was produced by Scott Quigg, Fiona Bartholomeus, and our executive producer Gianni Di Giovanni. As always, we'll be sticking the links to the topics we talked about on the show notes for our website at pix- at www.pixelsiv.com.au. Um, yeah. So, uh, Sarah, where else? What can you tell us about the store? Sorry, you can support Pixel Sift by visiting pixelsift.com.au forward slash store and pick yourself up a sweet Pixel Sift t shirt, tote bag, and more, which I haven't done yet. And you guys should do that before me because then you'll be way cooler than me, even though I'm on Pixel Sift. I mean, you can also enter the promo code SIFTERS and you'll get 25% off your order. That's pixelsift.com.au forward slash store and promo code SIFTERS. Yeah, so you can also find us on all the social media where you get alerts. Uh, we go live as so to get all the alerts when we go live. And you can submit your questions and ask the developers we speak to. Also, you can ask them questions as well. And on facebook.com forward slash pixel sieve, twitter.com forward slash pixel sieve, twitch.tv forward slash pixel sieve, and youtube.com forward slash pixel sieve AU. And uh, Sarah, if people want to listen to other episodes, where should they go? Now, before I answer that question, Mitch, we need to ask Nick, where can people, the good viewers, find more information about the American Dream? Uh, the best place is just samuraipunk.com. Uh, you can see all our other games on there as well. Thank you, APVR. Um, it's got all our stuff. We have a store, lots of cool merch, um, and the American Dream's all out there. Uh, you can also just find it on Oculus, PlayStation, and Steam. I just noticed our Nightbot was destroying Nick in the chat. That was... Uh... I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. Now, you can also go to our website to stream episodes, subscribe as a podcast, either on iTunes, Pocket Cast, or uh, or using the RSS link on our page. We're live every Thursday. Next week at this time, join us for Pixel Sift Plays as we check check play some of the indie games we feature on the podcast and more. Our next podcast episode is on the 26th of April. (laughs) <laughs> it's actually not the 26th of April, but don't, oh. worry. <laughs> but don't worry about it. Well, I, well, it's not my fault. It's two weeks from now, and uh, so thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> we'll catch you all later. Thank you very much, Nick.